Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video I'm going to talk about the Galant Schemata, which may be something you've heard of or maybe something that you're thinking, huh? what on earth is that about? Well, let me talk about the steel Galant first of all. And what we're just to, to give you a kind of historic context here, we're talking about a period of 50 years approximately between 1720 and 1770. So it's kind of the end of the Baroque period going into the beginning of the classical period. And what were the composers of the Gallant style kind of thinking? Well, fundamentally, they were concerned that the music of the Baroque had become rather too complicated, too elaborate, that maybe there was good reason to strip it down a bit, to simplify things, to have things that were kind of less embellished. And it wasn't just music, it was happening in the other arts as well. If you've ever been into one of those fantastic Baroque cathedrals, for example, you'll have seen all the fantastic kind of statues, the artwork, everything full of elaboration and ornamentation, fantastic detail in it. In the same way that when you listen to the music of Bach and Handel and people, you hear all this ornamentation, harmonic complexity, counterpoint, all fantastic stuff. And there are composers, as there are people in other arts, just saying, well, hang on a moment, we don't want this to go too far. Can we kind of strip it away in some effective sort of way? So this is where we are in thinking about the Galant Schemata. So that's the Galant bit of it. So what's the Schemata bit of it? Well, the Schemata bit of it is all about the fact that we've got um, particular patterns of melodic progression, of harmonic progression, of interplay between outer parts, where people thought, actually, this is a kind of standard opening or a standard close to something that works particularly well if we want to employ it in a piece of music. So some of these things have got funny names, like the first one we're looking at here, the Mayer, which is just named after the theorist who put it together. And the idea is just to sort of systemize this in some kind of way so that there was a, a kind of resource, a sort of bank of things, of progressions, that could be put together that would be something you would find in many pieces of music. And the reason for revisiting the Galant Schemata here is because actually these things might well be useful to people writing harmony today or people writing music in a fairly conventional diatonic style. So I've tried to sort of present all these things, uh, just examples, there are more of these actually, but we'll just look at some of these examples of the Galant Schemata. And you might think, actually, that would be really great to be able to, to use that in a piece. Or you may see music from this period and think, oh yeah, I can see some of this Galant Schemata at work. So let's have a look and, and see what it's about. So if we look at this first one, the Mayer, what I've done here is you can see you've got a melodic line in the treble clef, you've got a bass line in the bass clef. Um, I've presented it in Roman numerals for people who prefer to read chords in Roman numerals and also in figured bass below the stave uh, for those of you who prefer to read the figured bass. And if you're looking at this thinking, figured bass, what's that? Don't worry about it. You don't need to worry about it. But some people prefer to read the system of figured bass than they do the Roman numerals. And the figured bass is simply the Baroque way of uh, notating a chord. But let's have a look at this first one. So we begin to get the idea of, you know, what these things are really and why they might be effective. Well, here's a melodic line. Uh, they're purposely presented without any particular rhythm. So obviously you would have to put this in some kind of musical context with rhythm. Um, but here's a line that goes C, B, F, E. Now, this is just in C major for simplicity, but of course you could put that into any other key. So you start with the tonic, you go down a note to the leading note, the seventh degree of the scale, you go up to the fourth degree of the scale and down to the third. Although there's nothing particularly to stop you kind of going C, B and then down to F, E. So you can be quite flexible with this. 
One thing you notice about this particular bit of the schemata is that the base is going in contramotion with the top. And that's often something we see as a good habit when we're writing harmony. So you see what's happening here? The bass is doing the kind of mirror of the top part almost, isn't it? C going up to D, whereas the top part was going down. Then we're going down to B, where the top part goes up, and then it comes back to C again. So the outer parts sound like this. And then whether you want to read the Roman numerals or you want to read the uh, the figure bass, this is kind of the harmonic scheme that goes with it. So we have chord one, a five three chord. Then we go to a dominant seventh in its second inversion, five seven C, which would be figured as a four three. Then we go five seven B, so that's a dominant seventh in its first inversion, which is figured six five. Then we have a tonic chord, figured five three, chord one. So you see how that works? And the idea of these outer parts doing this is a particularly good habit. It makes for good harmony, makes for good design polarity between the outer parts, and it helps you avoid consecutives. But is that a useful standard progression? Well, it was the reason why it's there in the Gallant Schemata. Some of these were proposed as good openers, some were proposed as good closers, there are others that are um, proposed for modulation. So if you really want to get into this, you'll discover many more examples than I'm gonna go through here. But I just want to kind of share some of these with you because they're kind of really worth knowing about. Now, here's another example. This is called the Jupiter. And um, they've all got these funny names, aren't they? But uh, it's just another version. So what have we got this time? We've got a melody that's going C to D to F to E, or the first degree of the scale to the second, to the fourth, to the third. And we've got a bass that's going from the tonic down one to the leading note, repeating the leading note, coming back to the tonic. It's kind of not so different from our first example. But you see your chords this time. Uh, we've got one, five B, so just the dominant chord first inversion, five, seven B, the dominant seventh in first inversion, and then back to the tonic. And it's quite interesting, the five B going to the five, seven B means that you get a straight chord five in first inversion, then you elaborate that by making it a five seven B. So the inversion doesn't change, but the chord becomes richer. So instead of just repeating five, you know, how many times have you been in this situation where you're thinking, I've got this progression and it goes one, and then I've got to go five, and then there's nothing else to do but go five again, back to one, could be a bit boring. But what a big difference you can produce. If you can go one to five, in this case, five B, then enrich that five by making it five seven, in this case, five seven B, and then back to one, so much more effective. Again, notice this kind of polarity between the top and the bottom. Notice in the Jupiter, you've got a lot of stability in the bass line. So here's called one, five B, enriching to five, seven B, and then on to one. So you see how that five progresses to five, seven? It doesn't make the repetition of five boring, does it? It just enriches that five to go five, seven, beat. But stability in the bass, contra motion going on between the top and the bottom, it's a useful four chord progression that's not at all complicated. And it helps you to think about inversions as well. You know, instead of just going one, five, five, one, actually thinking one, five, B, five, seven, B to one, very effective. When you get five, seven, B to one as well, you notice how those outer parts pull in. Because when we resolve a dominant seventh chord, it's the voice leading, kind of where notes want to go, is telling us that the seventh really wants to fall by step, the third wants to rise by step. So we've got the seventh up here at the top, the F is the seventh of a five, seven chord. So that's falling by step. We've got the third of that same chord in the bass and that's rising by step. So we get the two things happening in the outer part. So it makes it very, there's very strong pull onto that last chord and the resolution of the third chord. So you can hear 
what the strength of the Jupiter is. And there's a second version of the Jupiter, let's just look at this one, where we've got 1 to 5, 7 in root position, 5, 7 again, going to 1. Now this time you might think, well that's a bit boring, isn't it, just doing that 5, 7 twice. But what's happening now is that the melody is moving. So we've got 5, 7 and then we've got 5, 7 in the melody. So here's called 1, we're going to 5, 7, and then the melody moves up to take over that seventh before it resolves down there. So there's a, a, a second version of the Jupiter where you're using root position for your 5-7, um, but the melody is now moving. So there's some kind of uh, move between the first 5-7 and the second 5-7, but this time it's more melodic. So um, that's another possibility. I have to say, I prefer the first version of the Jupiter marginally because I, I think it's more effective to go from 5 to 5, 7, and I like the first inversion of it as well. But say you've got a given melody and you think, well, actually, it'd be more useful in this particular instance to do this. Well, there's the second version of the Jupiter. So that's that one. And then let's look at another example. Here's the, the April. And uh, What's happening here, again, you see the polarity between the top and the bottom. You know, it's completely symmetrical, this one, isn't it? We start with these two Zs, both parts step one towards each other. They both step out a third, and then they step back towards each other. So even if you just get the principles of that kind of contramotion between top and bottom, and how sometimes you can actually have a symmetry between the top and the bottom, well, these things are useful just to sort of take that on board, really, and think as a general principle of writing harmonically. That's a useful one to get hold of. And it's really going to help you avoid those consecutives, uh, which is a handy thing to be able to do. And again, we're using five sevens, but do you see how the inversions are switching? So we're going one, five, five, one, but the two fives this time, five, seven, C. So we've got a dominant seventh in its second inversion going on to a five, seven, B, a dominant seventh in its first inversion. So how does this one go? Here's the chord one, five, seven, C, or a four, three chord, five, seven, B, or a six, five chord, on to chord one, or a five, three chord. Now that's a very satisfying progression, isn't it? Satisfying harmonically, the 5-7-C going to 5-7-B before it resolves to 1. Very satisfying melodically between the outer parts. And I find that people sometimes don't think enough about inversions of dominant 7th chords. Um, they work so well in inversion. So uh, the schemata also encourage you to, to think about that a bit. So that's the April. Well, here's another one. And um, the pastorella, what's happening here? Well, in a way, it's a fairly straightforward one, this one, isn't it? But the idea that you're going one, five, seven, five, seven, one is very similar to an earlier one we were looking at. But this is how this one's going, where you've got your bass just going tonic, dominant, dominant, tonic. And the upper part moving around the median node. So third degree of the scale, the median, down one, hot the other side of it come back. You know, it's a great way of kind of decorating something. You know how sometimes when you write and you get somewhere, you know, a little bit too early, you think, well, I've arrived on this chord one, but I'm not really quite at the end of the phrase. So what can I do? Well, having got this note, you go down one, you hop the other side of it, you come back, and then you've got some harmony to go with it. In this case, we've got chord one, or a five, three chord, and then a five, seven chord, or a seven, another five, seven, or a seven, and then going to one on that five three. These galant schemata also help us to see something else. We've talked about the resolution of a five seven chord, how that normally the seventh falls by step and the third rises by step, but quite often in the schemata you get a five seven that's repeated or a five seven that moves from one inversion to another before it resolves, and that's another thing you can do with a five seven. You don't have to resolve it immediately, you could delay the resolution by presenting it again, the same chord, in a different position or a different inversion. So it makes that point. So that's the pastorella. Well, this one has got a very simple um, title, the sol, fa, mi, uh, which is sol, fifth degree of the scale, fa, the fourth degree of the scale, 
me the third degree of the scale. So you see what this is doing. The melody is going five, four, four, three. Sol, fa, fa, mi. And again, it's got this bass kind of doing a little bit of um, contramotion there. And then when the melody repeats, that's when the bass moves down. So instead of just kind of repeating the bass, which is something that we can all be tempted to do. I've got a repeated note in the melody. Okay, let's just repeat the note in the bass. Let's just repeat the chord. You see what's happening here. We've got chord one, or five, three. We're going to chord two, or five, three. And then as we repeat that melodic note, we're going to a five, seven, B or a six, three chord before we resolve onto the final chord one, or five, three chord. That's quite a satisfying one, isn't it? And you see that repeated F then doesn't become a weakness. It actually becomes a strength, doesn't it? We've got this chord two, this minor chord, and then the 5-7-B is so much stronger. And it has a pull onto this last note because that 5-7 needs resolution. So you see there's something to learn from these things. Ah, there's a second version of the Sol Fa Mi. This is how this one goes this is quite an interesting one because can you see here we've got chord one and this time we're using seven b and then a five seven b to a one now some people might be rather surprised at this because there are lots of textbooks that would say avoid chord seven it's a pile of trouble basically and um, why do they say that is because it's a diminished chord b d f in the key of c it's the only diminished chord in a major scale and it can be a bit awkward in sound and when it's used in root position it can sound, sound a little bit ugly but actually as soon as you put it in a first inversion it tends to sound a bit better so if you're going to use a diminished chord the advice is often use it in first inversion you might actually sometimes use it in second inversion but it usually works better to invert it rather than to have it in root position and of course in this case it's another way of saying instead of using the same chord twice for the second and the third notes I've got the possibility of a little variation by going one seven b five seven b to one so you can see where that's going so that's the second version of that well here's another one the Romanesca and what's happening this time well we've got something a bit more interesting in a way we've got chord one a five three chord we've got a repeated note in the melody this time so what are we doing we're going to five b or a six three chord then we're jumping up to c but we're using chord six or a five three chord and then we're jumping down to g in the melody back to where we started and we're going to use a one b or a six three chord it's a sort of thing, isn't it? If you are being asked to harmonize a melody in an exam, or you were writing a melody and you sort of got a bit stuck, you might be puzzling over what to do with four notes in a melody where three of them are the same note. You know, G, G, up to C, back to G. You know, it's very easy just to get a bit stuck. You might look at those four notes and think, well, what shall I do? One, 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 one. It'd be boring, wouldn't it? So. This is just exploring actually what else can I do with that well look at that bass kind of going down the scale and then having a leap at the end that's quite a nice shape for the bass isn't it again it's going in contramotion with the soprano part you know we've got leaps in the top part between the second and third and the third and fourth notes but the leap in the bass is reserved for the end you know all sorts of things going on here and we've got the changes of chord one to 5b to 6 which is a minor chord which is a nice contrast and then back to 1b so we've got major major minor major that's a nice touch isn't it so um, I'm hoping you're sort of looking at these now thinking oh actually there's some value in this well what about this one the printer well what we're doing here we've got a descending melodic line going from the sixth to the fifth to the fourth to the third degree of the scale just coming down a scale and in a way you might say well hang on this isn't doing what you were talking about earlier because the bass is moving absolutely in parallel with the soprano 
I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying quite often having contramotion between the top and the bottom is a good thing and it certainly helps to avoid consecutives. Now you've got to be really careful when the two parts, top and bottom, are going in the same direction by the same interval because that's when you do end up writing consecutives. You know, if you'd done this, you know, it's fine if you like the sound of that, but it's full of fifths. So convention says that there's, there is usually better ways of harmonizing it than to doing it in such a way that you end up with a load of consecutive fifths or consecutive octaves. So when the top and bottom are going in the same direction, you've got to be particularly careful. Okay, so how does this deal with it? Well, it starts with a chord four or a five three chord. It then says, okay, let's not have another root position chord because that's the thing that's going to give us consecutives. So we'll have a one B here or a 6-3 chord, so you see how that avoids. And then we're gonna use this 7-B that we talked about a moment ago. So that's kind of doing that. And by the way, before somebody says that's consecutives, it isn't because that's a perfect fifth and that's a diminished fifth. So if you do that, that's okay. But then you'll notice that this is embellished because when you look at the figured base, it doesn't say 6-3, it's going 7-6. So what we're doing here is having a little suspension. So the 1B, the second chord, and then we're going to go 7-6 above the bass. You see how that C is a seventh above the D in the bass, going to 6, and then onto a 5-3 chord. So... That's a very effective progression, isn't it, for four descending notes like that, managing to avoid those consecutives, even though top and bottom are running parallel with each other. Um, and there's a second version of this, which we'll look at now, where we go four to one B, and we've got this seven B again with a seven six suspension, and then that can prepare you for a five seven onto a one. So that's just extending things a little bit into that cadence. Kind of useful, isn't it? Because sometimes we think, oh yeah, there's a useful pattern, but I've got an extra note in my version. Well, that's kind of what that is showing you there, isn't it? So you get the idea as to what these are about. Now, there are many more examples. We could sit and go through many more of these, um, but I'm hoping that that has in itself explored some useful principles when it comes to writing harmony, when it comes to matching top and bottom lines, uh, when it comes to thinking about avoiding things that don't sound so good, like the consecutives, how to vary major and minor chords, what to do if the outer parts are running parallel. There are lots of useful things here. But these were put together as kind of useful openers, closers, but actually useful mid-phrase sometimes as well. So it's an introduction to the Galant Schemata, a little thought about this steel Galant and what was going on between 1720 and 1770 that helped transition us from a Baroque style to a classical style, but also just looking at these particular examples from the Schemata that you might want to examine in more detail and, um, and work out for yourself or possibly use. And if you're really keen to investigate the subject further, if you look up the Galant Schemata, you'll find further examples that go into more detail, that investigate modulation and all sorts of other exciting harmonic things. So, things that were used by composers of the past that might be very useful resources for musicians today, either who are writing music or playing music, thinking, what are these progressions? Can I see what's happening? And you might even have a moment of excitement where you play a piece from the classical period and think, hey, there's an example of the mayor or the printer or something that we learned about in the Galant Schemata.